Next, let's look at the context switch. The trigger has happened, and the context switch is the process by switching from the main program in to the interrupt service routine. So we're executing here in the main programming. The trigger happens and we're going to switch over to the interrupt service routine. So can you show me the detail of the program that's currently running? Maybe an instruction or something that gets interrupted? Sure. The main program by, might be reading and it might be starring. So the program counter might be pointing to an instruction as it executes. So this is the assembly code of the C code that, might have, that we may have written. And this is what is being run right now. Yeah, so we're in the main program running something. Program counter points to where we are. And now the trigger has happened. The first thing that will happen is assuming the priority is high enough and it's armed and enabled and the I bit is all zero like we did before, the first thing that will happen is it will finish the instruction. Instructions take a finite amount of time to execute. So this instruction that I'm executing will finish. The second thing that has to happen is we have to suspend. Suspend means make a record of where we were. And that is going to be used or recorded onto our stack. And the stack pointer points to the top of the stack. And when the interrupt happens, we're going to push R0, R1, R2, R3, pushes R12, R14, which is the link register, R15, which is the program counter, and it will push the program status word. And the order it does it is the program status word is here, program counter, link register, R12, a lot of registers, R3, R2, R1, R0, such that the new stack pointer is pointing way up here and eight registers have been pushed on the stack. So why are we only pushing these registers and what about those other registers, R4 through R11? These eight registers are actually not pushed on the stack. And so when the programmer writes their interrupt service routine, we will not use R4 through R11, are not used in the interrupt service routine. So there's no need to save them. Exactly. The third step is to set the link register to a special code. And this special code is FFF, FFF, 9. You notice the link register is odd and it's got this weird thing. This pattern means I'm running in an interrupt service routine. And we will see why this special pattern is required when we see the details of how we return from an interrupt to the main program that was interrupted. Exactly. The IPSR register is going to be set to the interrupt number. There are hundreds of interrupts. And so this register will contain the interrupt number of the device that's currently executing in the ISR. And finally, the program counter is loaded with the address of the interrupt service routine. And this is called the vector. So with this five-step process, we suspended the current pro program, which is the main, and we call this the main thread, and we're able to transfer control to the interrupt service routine thread. So we have two threads, 
the main thread and the interrupt service routine thread and the control now is with the interrupt service routine thread. You want to see how we get back? Yeah, let's look at it. So right here at the end of the interrupt service routine is an instruction called BXLR and that is to attempt to put the link register back into the program counter. But because the link register has this special number, instead of storing this in the program counter and jumping off into nowhere land, what it will do is it will then pop. This BXLR instruction will then pop these eight registers off of the stack, including the program counter. And so this instruction here will return back to where we interrupted from which will bring the counter, the program counter, to the next instruction because that's what was saved on the stack. Perfect. So interrupt service, interrupts are a powerful mechanism, but with power such as this comes, comes responsibility. That is, in your interrupt service routine, you have to be careful to do certain things and not do certain other things. So let's begin with good practices. Okay. One of the important things to do in the interrupt service routine is to acknowledge. Acknowledging is to clear the trigger flag. Remember the trigger flag caused the interrupt to happen and the software should clear it. So not clearing the, the trigger has the potential to make the interrupt be considered unserviced and therefore the interrupt continues to be uh, triggered again and again so you get stuck in your interrupt service routine. Yeah, we call that a crash. Yeah. All right, that's not good, so we will acknowledge. The second thing we're gonna do, think about when we write interrupt service routines is to make them very, very short and a short interrupt service routine will guarantee that all the interrupts get service. Well, while we're talking about what to do, let's talk about what not to do. I think Good interrupt service routines do not have delay loops. This means that I don't think that once you get an interrupt service routine that you should wait or loop over and over and over again. The second thing has to do with how often we trigger an interrupt. So let's do a profile. In other words, if the interrupts were to occur at this rate, it will be important for us not to have the interrupt service routine take longer than the time between interrupts. So good practice is the interrupt service routine rate, whatever it is, the time between the interrupts, this should be long compared to the time it takes to execute the interrupt service routine. This is obvious because otherwise you'd have pending interrupt triggers that have, will never get serviced. Yeah, we see in this case here, right here, we're actually going to attempt to interrupt ourselves to do this task, which would be a crash. 